YouTube and Gamer Nation to the first episode of Joystick Justice League, this brand new podcast dedicated to giving you the most recent breaking news of the video game industry and stuff that isn't even out yet, plus the final reviews of some of the hottest new releases and also some of the hidden gem masterpieces you may have missed. I am the founder of Joystick Justice League. My name is Mike Frusios. You can also check out my blog, which is the Alarm Bell Network, which is alarmbellnetwork.wordpress.com, and I'm joined by my co-host, this is uh, Joe Morin. Uh, you can uh, check out my blog at uh, joemorin.appleguy at blogspot.ca. That's right, people, and the key is getting connected. So if you see something you like, make sure you like and share it to your friends so that the good word spreads. We are an alternative news uh, outfit that is basically dedicated to providing you with a lot of the game news that you don't really see in a lot of the other corporate gaming sites. But anyway, I'm going on. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of brand new indie stuff on the horizon, especially with the with basically the new generation that just came about. The PS4 just came out, the Xbox One, the Wii U is still going strong. So let's get started with a really cool title that's going to have some stiff competition, but nevertheless it looks like it's going to have some legs. This game is called Bound by Flame. Okay, so this one's coming out from Spiders Games, which is a division of Focus Home Interactive. And uh, Spiders is basically, these are the guys who gave us Fairy Legends of Avalon and also the recent Mars Warlogs, which came out on PC, PS3, and uh, Xbox 360. So this one's actually coming out somewhere in 2014 for the PC, PS4, PS3, Xbox 360. So Joe, you saw the trailer with me. What did you, what did you kind of gather from what you saw here? Very uh, Dark Souls kind of a feel to it. It, uh, you know, it's a real, you know, it's going to be for the, the, those hardcore RPG guys out there. It's, um, you know, it's it, you're not going to be able to, to just fly through this thing. You're going to have to dedicate some time and really pick your spots and, and uh, make sure that uh, you have the weapons and everything you need because it's going to be a tough game, guys. It's, uh, you know, you're not going to fly through it. You're going to have to really put some time into it. It's, it looks really, really sweet. Oh, yeah. I mean, like we were saying, this really demands your skills as, as a gamer. Like, if you play Dark Souls or Demon Souls, you can't waste any time in these games. I mean, every block, every counter, every hit matters. But like what I was saying before is that this game is coming out at a time where there's really some really stiff competition. I mean, we have Capcom's uh, Deep Down, which is a PS4 exclusive coming out. Um, and then also you have the major Dark Souls 2 sequel that's also coming out sometime in 2014 from Namco Bandai. It seems like this. It, there's a lot of competition. What, what do you think is gonna make um, Bound by Flame stand out. It's uh, going to be. It's going to be the come down to like what it does with every other game. You know, is that gameplay. They're, they're going to do something that makes them stand out from uh, from uh, Dark Souls and uh, in Deep Down. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. You know, the, like Mike said, there's some stiff competition with them. But uh, if they, you know, if they come out at the right time. And if the time is good and the gameplay is good, they're going to do all right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fantasy genre is something that will never get too old. Or people will always be, be into like that, that medieval age. And, and I just, kind of inferences I can make just from this little taste we got from the trailer, knowing what Spiders has done with their past games, specifically Mars Warlogs, which if you've played it, it it's kind of like uh, this post-apocalyptic game, but it's got like a Mass Effect structure to it. So it's a third person melee shooter, but then it also has, you know, you can interact with characters and, and pick from like narrative story trees. So I, I, I have a feeling that, that that's what's gonna kind of space this out from like the, say like the action heavy Dark Souls 2 or Deep Town, where this is gonna maybe bring more of an emotional element and character development. Uh, I even noticed uh, when, I, when I was watching uh, the footage as well, it, uh, I even noticed that uh, you're not just generically attacking the guys. Like I even noticed, like he's, you're, yeah. you can, you're attacking specific points, and that affects you know that's going to come into the strategy of you know, how you're going to take these guys on. You know, you're not just hacking and slashing away. You, you got you're going to have to pick your spots and really fight through this thing. Yeah, so it's almost like it's like the thinking man's hardcore brawler. So it remains to be seen. So that's coming out sometime in 2014 from Spiders and Focus Interactive. Also on the horizon, this is uh, this is going to be one that's going to be exciting to people who grew up in the 90s and were fans of Shadow of the Beast, yeah. which was basically the flagship game for the Amiga and also got ported over to like the Sega Master System, Super NES. Um, you saw a bit of like Shadow of the Beast, the original, so what did you kind of gather from what, what you've seen and where we might be heading? 
Well, well, back on the old systems, I mean, it's it, it uh, from what I saw. You know, I never got to play it myself, unfortunately. It looked really unique. You know, even uh, as you're navigating through, I didn't notice that you're not always getting attacked from head on. Sometimes you're getting attacked from behind. So you're, you're not just, it's not, they're not just generically coming at you. It, it's, it, it looked pretty damn cool. Exactly. It, it felt like what Altered Beast would have been like on the Turbo Graphics 16, oh, yeah. you know, when, when, like when you'd play Keith Courage and all of a sudden, like you were saying, multi directional attacks, multi level platforming. Um, but now, from when we see the HD reboot version, this one's coming out from Heavy Spectrum Entertainment Labs. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is a beloved 90s franchise that's being taken on by a publisher that I checked their resume, they've only done two free to play PS Vita games. Uh, I played them, I have them on my Vita, they're called Puzzle Ball and Bully and Blitz. And they're basically very simple, kind of, you know, iPhone style games. We're talking about, like, from what I can see in this Shadow of the Beast trailer, it looks like it's going to be like a full on AAA third person brawler. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see what they can do. These guys can, can step it up and uh, make something good. And like you said, it's uh, this is a game that's got a cult following and these guys really love this. So hopefully these guys can do some justice and, and come up with something sweet. Absolutely. I think this is the right kind of game that the PS4 is going to need, say, next Christmas or next spring when, when the Xbox One Titans start coming out, like Titanfall yeah. and, and all these big heavy hitters and like Halo 5 starts coming out. The PS4 is going to need something in the absence of a God of War sequel, which has yet to be announced. You know, we obviously know that after the kind of failure of God of War Ascension, Santa Monica's got to go back to the drawing board for yeah. that franchise. I think from what I can see from this Shadow of the Beast trailer, this could possibly be to God of War 4 what Heavenly Sword was to God of War 3 on the PS3. An early tech demo, something similar in the vein to God of War, but showing us what the early generation tech of PS3 could do when they finally mastered the system and actually were able to put out God of War 3, the masterpiece that it was. Yeah, so you know, some of, some of the other guys are gonna probably look at this and, and, and see, you know, it's gonna give these guys a starting point and they're gonna, it's gonna show them and then they can add, add their own stuff onto it. But uh, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be one of the many examples of games that we're gonna talk about of, the, of uh, Sony backing a lot of these uh, indie guys to, to make some really cool games. I think it's going to make them stand out from uh, from some... I haven't seen a whole lot of this on uh, Xbox One. No. So the, this is going to be a, a real... You could almost call it a trump card for, for Sony. It's uh, There's some really cool games coming out that Sony's backing that wouldn't traditionally... Uh, Get made in like yeah. other, other markets. I mean, they're, yeah. they're putting a lot of faith in these smaller ideas, but this isn't even a small idea, but it's a small developer, and just the fact yeah. that they're giving them this AAA club, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, this is, again, it's just a cinematic trailer. We don't even know that this is gonna be 3D or 2D, yep. but it's got me excited. I think, it's, like, telling from the production design, use of art, use of color, um, just even seeing people play the old Shadow of the Beast and seeing the character design and level design, I think we're in, possibly in for a treat and a nice exclusive in the, in the upcoming console war. So that's Shadow of the Beast, uh, real, no real date on that one yet, but look for it soon. Next one, kind of flipping over to the survival horror genre, there's this new indie game called Soma coming from Frictional Games somewhere in 2015, so this is really early on the horizon, but we've actually managed to see some gameplay footage already, so what did you think of what you saw? It, it looked pretty good, I, was for, I think it's kind of still in the alpha kind of stage, I don't know if they're even at, at beta yet, but it, it's, uh, it reminds me a lot of, uh, of Navigate, of uh, like a Mist kind of style game, you know, with, a, with a bit more of a sense of urgency. It, it's a, it looks pretty cool, it's uh, going to be so far just PC and PS4, we'll, we'll see if it comes out on something else. But, uh, you know, it, it looks cool. I think so too. I, I, I like what you said about Mist because it seems like it takes Mist to the next level. I, I see where yeah. you're going with that because it, it, the, what we saw in the trailer and the early footage is the fact that it's very, there's a heavy emphasis on sound and, and environment. There aren't like a lot of like gory creatures jumping out at you. There's not a lot of action. There's just a lot of creepiness, a lot of atmosphere. And, and there's a heavy, heavy leaning on like the aliens mythology like, yeah. and, and the visuals. I mean, it definitely feels like you're almost in like a sequel to aliens. So I, I like the fact that we're seeing a survival horror game that's not just kind of going for the tried and true so, tropes of like an, asi alien, uh, like an insane asylum or like a zombie farm. Yeah. We're actually seeing some, some some classic UFO kind of stuff kind of come back into into the into the zeitgeist. So 
I don't know, this, this could be really cool. It's a first person game. These are the guys who made Amnesia, which was kind of one of those games that people slept on this generation. Yeah. It came up with PS3, 360. What did you see from Amnesia that we can kind of learn about maybe where this Soma game is going to go? Well, you know, it's so it seems what these guys are doing is they're, they're basically taking Amnesia and, and adding more of the atmosphere to it. You know, uh, Amnesia, you know, it, it felt, a little, felt a little stale from, from, what, from what I saw. And, and it seems like they're adding on to it. And it's, you know, because this is on a console, and if you're, you know, if, and if they, they, they do this right, you know, even if you're, if you're playing on a, on a good big screen with some surround sound, some of the stuff that I've seen, you know, it's, it should be, it should be pretty cool. Yeah, it's funny you say like Amnesia kind of felt stale. Like why, like you meant, you said to me like why, like you kind of felt like when you were watching the gameplay footage, like why this kind of felt not up to par with like the current generation standards. Well, it, it, it didn't, it didn't quite. Like, he, like it felt too on rails in a sense. Sort of, yeah, yeah. It felt felt on on rails, and, and uh, I felt a bit of a disconnect because you, you, it's you know, it's a first person perspective, and you, it, it felt a little odd even when you were picking up objects and interacting with stuff. It didn't feel like you were you were really controlling. It almost felt like when I said you were like kind of like mind bending. Some of the stuff's moving in it, it, it seemed a little weird to me. Yeah, I think that that's part of the theme that you can mind bet objects, but it if it's not, it. the fact that you're not, like, you can see in the, in the gameplay footage, there's no animation of the hand flicking a switch or anything like yeah. that. And, and I think at this point, so late in the game, it's, it's kind of inexcusable to not dedicate system memory to be able to produce all those animations to kind of, you know, pull you into the game's atmosphere. I think that, like you were saying, it's kind of a disconnect. Yeah, yeah you know, it could be something that, that, they, that they could add on to later. I mean, We'll see. It's got time. I mean, it's flavored 2015, so it's I think at this point, it's, it's, it, yeah, I think I think the it, it's nice. It's a bit of a nod to like Half Life 2 and Portal, you know, where you have objects floating in space, mm -hmm. but you know, you're you, you you already know as a gamer that you're picking those things up. But I think the novelty is kind of worn off now. Unless again, like you're saying, if it's like some kind of mind control thing, I understand why there's a, an animate object floating in space. But I think at this point, they should be taking this time to really put those little touches to kind of. That encourage that suture of audience to content. And if the, if if they they don't maybe add that in, you know, then they might have to maybe add that into the element. Maybe that it is a kind of supernatural thing where you are controlling. That, exactly. That, with, with that stuff, and, 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 you know, and then that would be cool. They could do it like Bioshock did, but yeah. like with 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 the the vigors and stuff, where right. it, it's justifiably with the, the theme, the thematic content that yes, something's flowing in space. Anyway, it may sound like a triviality, but. You know, Suture does play a lot into the interactive experiences in the interactive entertainment, but again, it does have an amazing atmosphere to it. I love the yeah. fact that it's using the aliens tropes and something to look forward to from uh, Frictional Games, summer 2015. Next up, oh man, you were excited when you saw this one. This is uh, this is one of the ones that I've been telling people about. This is going to be one of those aces in the hole that the PS4 is going to have as a console, well not a console exclusive, it's coming out for PC. But it's not coming out for Xbox yet. This one, and what's funny is because it's coming from Super Giant Games. This is called Transistor. So this is slated for next year, possibly you know February, March. I'm thinking um, this is coming from the guys that made Bastion, which was like a big Xbox hit, and they're not even planning to do this game on Xbox. You know, I've heard, heard about Bastion for a while, but uh, believe it or not, I, I didn't start playing this game until I, I, uh, I saw it available on, on uh, iOS for iPad. Yeah. And when I got this thing, I mean, I fell in love with this game. I mean, and uh, you know, we'll see if uh, Transistor you know, makes its way on, onto uh, iOS devices and possibly even Android, because it, it felt so cool playing Bastion on, on a touch screen. And, and what Transistor is doing is, is they're they're adding on to it that they're they're putting some other elements into it. You're you're planning your, your attack out more. Like you're 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 picking the path of the attacks that you, that, uh, that you're making. I mean it's I'm really looking forward to this one. I think the reason that you're you're lashing on to the fact that games like Bastion and you know eventually Transistor play so well on tablet is because it is an RTS game. Yeah. It's it's three quarter overhead, just like Diablo, just like like Bastion, and that lends itself to more of like a touch interface. And and, and what I really like about this game is just it's just the the art and the design. I mean, it looks cool. this isn't like your typical overhead RTS, which has traditionally been kind of routed in fantasy or steampunk or military command and conquer civilization but now we've got something that's kind of trippy almost blade runner-esque and that i guess that is steampunk in a sense but it's something completely different but it's just the fact that you've got these japanese tropes like she's got the huge sword that she's dragging behind her and, and like you said it kind of reminded you of another game 
Final Fantasy VII. Absolutely. I mean, I mean you're, you're literally looking at her, and, and like the sword's as big as she is. And uh, it's, I'm really looking for it. It's you know, I'm probably gonna. I'm hoping it comes out on uh, an iPad. But I mean, it's gonna be cool no matter what you, no matter what you play on it. Uh, this is one of my favorite games on this list. It's it's gonna be sweet, mate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good on so many levels. Like we were saying when we watched the trailer. And not only does it have your Diablo-esque, you know, three-quarter overhead battle elements, but I mean, you can literally freeze the action like you would do in the Bureau XCOM Declassified, and actually start to do real-time strategy elements yep. in, 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 in suspended in space, where like you said, you can draw lines using your touchpad on your DualShock 4, and, and create environmental hazards, which is also something we saw in games like Okami yep. HD, or for PS2 and PS3, where you could freeze the action, draw dots, which would create environmental hazards and either defend you or attack your enemies. There's so much to this, especially, this, this seems like a very deep, uh, apocalyptic storyline. Yeah. Incredible soundtrack. If you actually get a chance to actually watch the full trailer on YouTube, check out the original music. This one is, is gonna be, it's not gonna be like a system seller, but it's definitely gonna be something that the PS4 fanboys are just gonna grab too tight. Especially knowing how, again, how Bastion became like an underground and eventual, eventual mainstream phenomenon. I think Sony's done a really good service for themselves aligning themselves as super giant. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, this not going to be the end for these guys. I mean, uh, they, they, they seem like the, the guys, they're going to continue to cover some really cool stuff. And, and you know, with these two games, I mean, I think they're just getting started. And this is going to be pretty sweet. Oh, absolutely. So, a great exclusive. But like I said, coming out on PC as well. So, all you Steam fans, you'll be able to get this as soon in 2014. So, check it out, Transistor. Uh, coming up next, we also have Child of Light. So, Child of Light, this is a new one from uh, UV Art Framework. Ubisoft Montreal, which are the same people who actually brought us Rayman Origins yeah. and Rayman Legends. So I think you can see from watching the trailer where this game is easily coming from. What did you gather? Why why should people be playing this game? It's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, I think uh, definitely fans of Rayman are, are gonna are gonna latch up latch on to this. It's a, uh, you know, it's coming out for for all all, all the major consoles. It, uh, you know, it, uh, it might lend itself more and more to the Wii U because it, it, it does seem like there's some, some touch involved there. It reminds me of Dragon Crown. Absolutely. It, the, 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 the Dragon's yeah. Crown comparison yeah. is immediate in the yeah. sense that it's, it's a 2D, hand-drawn, side-scrolling RPG, but where it separates itself from the incredible Dragon's Crown, and if you haven't played it, it's, it's a $40 play. purchase for either PS3 or Vita. But anyway, getting back to Child of Light, uh, what makes it different is the fact that it's actually turn-based battle. So whereas Dragon's Crown was real time, this is turn-based, so it quickly turns it into kind of, kind of like a Final Fantasy Tactics affair. And I think that's that's where a game like this, where where it already seems kind of meditative and slow-paced, I think that making it like a like a real-time action brawler would have actually taken away from like the sublime nature yeah. of what I'm seeing here. I think this meant this game is meant to be savored, meant to just be enjoyed on like a long scale, meant to be read. And you mentioned something about that too. Like people are always shitting on games because there's a lot of reading involved. Well, I mean that's how you build story, and especially when you're doing a comic book style kind of game like this, it lends itself to it. Absolutely. And, and like you said, I mean, we got hand drawn art, so it's just gonna look gorgeous. There like you see screen. You mentioned the 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 fact that this is coming out for the Wii U, the PS4, Xbox, PC. But think about what you're seeing in the trailer. You've also got like in Rayman Legends, you've got a buddy that you can control with the touchpad interface, or have maybe a second player play co-op and and control the little sprite that follows you around, like you have in like you know, Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and all these. It's basically like a pretty standard theme along these games. So I, I like the fact that it's gonna, it's most likely gonna take advantage of the PS Vita and Wii U second screen interface, which is gonna add a, a beautiful co-op dimension to this game. Yeah, and you know, I'm hoping that this will be something that, because uh, it is coming on the Wii U, you know, we all know it's, they're not doing all that hot right now. This will be one of those games, you know, it, uh, there's some pretty cool elements to it uh, that uh, you may have already mentioned. But uh, you know, even as you're attacking, you know, there's there's beams of light focusing on the character that you're attacking. They they're using some of some cool effects, and uh, you know, hopefully this will be something to kind of pull them out of the red and maybe it'll draw some attention and be one of these things that will kind of help them along. Because I mean, you know, I know I'm, I'm leaving out the other guys here, but I think this is something that, that hopefully it's going to help out the Wii U because. They need some help, Mike. Uh, I think it's going to be a game that, that hopefully this will be a game that will save them a little bit. It's not, it's not a Pokemon. It's not a, a Mario. 
you know, it, but it's something that younger viewers and yeah. especially I'd say female gamers can attach themselves yeah, to. Sure. Female gamers who who appreciate good story, character development, and and, and, and if you're out there and, and you, let's, let's just talk about Raven Legends for example. I mean, it's on every platform known to man, but yeah. most people feel that the Wii U version is the superior version to play because of the second screen interface. Yeah. So I think again, that's what maybe if they can limit the Vita support on the Sony version, this may be what draws people to the Wii U version. So we'll, we'll see what happens with Child Light. I'm really excited about that. I love like little simple games, like but like very deep games like this. And they're, 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 they're it's a it's a Ubisoft Montreal guys. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, these guys. Assassin's you know, Creed, Rayman. They, they make a lot of sweet, and it's just it's a bonus that they're they're yeah. Canadian, and, and these guys they yeah. make some pretty sweet games. So support your Canadian games. Oh yeah. Staying with the Sublime, a big one on the rise, I'm sure some of you have heard this. It was supposed to be a launch title for PS4. It's been pushed back, but knowing the game's creator, that's not a big surprise. He's a perfectionist, and that is a good thing. Jonathan Blow, the maker of Braid, is now coming out with his AAA console follow-up, The Witness. All right, so this one is purely for the PS4 at this point, okay? So this, this is a major bold move for Jonathan Blow, who, for a long time, I think pretty well. No, Braid's been out on PS3 since about 09, yep. but it was essentially an Xbox hit and a PC hit. When I watched any game of the movie, of which Jonathan Blow was one of the main three characters that they followed, you could tell Jonathan Blow didn't have the greatest time working within uh, the Microsoft structure. So I think, like a lot of indie developers, he saw Sony. Uh, and their welcoming attitude towards the indie scene and, and, their, and their nurturing of it. Mm -hmm. I think he saw that opportunity and, he's, and you can tell he's getting a lot of support on this game. Sony's been behind the witness from day one and, and I think we know why because you were pretty baffled by this, so was I. Um, what, do you, what did you gather from this game? This isn't your average game. This is, again, like Braid, like, Braid, like anything Blow does, this is very unique and it's going to have a very divisive audience. No, this is something uh, for, for him, I mean, uh, this guy's you know, you know, it's a real labor. It seems like he's really, really putting a lot of time into this, Mike. It seems like a real labor of love to him. And, and this isn't your, your 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 typical game, in my opinion. It, it's it's it looks wise. It, it immediately reminded me of like a it's like a Zelda kind of atmosphere. But this is from what, from what I can see, it's purely a, a, a puzzle game. And, and uh, as you're, as you're working your way through these puzzles, you, you can see that, that it's it looks like it's opening up different places, you know. So you're, it's I was a little confused at first when I first saw this, and it, it looked like you were just solving puzzles for the sake of solving puzzles. But it looks like it's as you open up these puzzles, you're opening up the world and getting a chance to explore it for I'm thinking some greater purpose. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And if you played Braid, you know that Jonathan Blow loves to play with conceptions of time and, yep. and working in reverse as well. It is in addition to always moving yep. forward, which we've always been taught is sometimes always the way to progress a plot. Well, not yep. necessarily. If anybody ever watched the movie Memento, you know that things can go backwards. And also, if you've ever played the game The Unfinished Swan, which came out from Sony Japan last year, same idea. You start with a white screen and you throw out splotches of paint and that opens up the story world. So it's almost like peeling back <coughs> the layers. And I see where he's going with this here. I, me too, like when I first watched this, we watched an extensive video of the puzzle solving mechanics. What, what did I keep saying to you? Where's the payoff? Yeah. And, and then we saw the trailer and we saw it, right? You saw it, things opening up in the environment, yeah. doors opening. But I think there's going to be an even bigger payoff, and you know we'll, we'll see what the, the end result is here. But I mean, it, the, this looks so really cool. I mean, I, I haven't really seen anything like this. This looks pretty unique, and it, it's being done by a guy who obviously takes a lot of passion. And it's, it's oh, he's he's meticulous. And uh, you know, so I'm sure, sure it's going to be something cool. I don't think it's going to end up just being limited to, to PS4, but I mean. It, it, we'll see. I, I'm not expecting to see this on, on, on the Wii U. Solely for the purpose that uh, you know, their controller doesn't, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna work right for that game. But I, I think we'll end up seeing it on Xbox. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I don't see Jonathan Blow for going into their platforms, but mm -hmm. at the same point, I think that Sony did strike a chord with their with their welcoming attitude towards Indies and the fact that they're now starting with the time rele time releases. So yeah. we already know that. Hotline Miami 2, Hotline Miami 2, sorry, is supposed to launch first on PS4, but it will be coming over to other platforms. They're all seeing the game reverse now, yep. where Sony doesn't even need to throw money at publishers to get those timing services. It's them. just about throwing out respect, and yeah. that's what I see. So yeah, again, I may sound like a fanboy, I'm not. I play games, not consoles, but looking at it from a business and cultural standpoint, 
you got to look at it like at the fact that respect can go a long way and yeah Sony may be a large trans transnational corporation but Sony Computer Entertainment itself is run by game developers who have been through all these hurdles that we saw in the game the movie and know what it's like to be that little upstart developer who's trying to get out a very unique idea in a market cluttered full of military shooters yeah. and third person Batman Asylum ripoffs. You know, it's just, it, it's it's tough. Yeah, yeah. It, you can just imagine Jonathan Blow going to a Microsoft exec pitch meeting with this idea. They would have turned it down flat. Yeah, because yeah. when he says to them, Witness is not gonna have your traditional story structure or anything. It's really it's just about later. the experience. Later, so. Goodbye. Yeah. But, Sony, we, we already know, like like look at the look at the PSN store. I mean there's a lot of quirky titles and this totally fits in with the realm of what they're trying to do, especially some games we're gonna be getting out later in the episode like Doki Doki Universe. So I mean that's the witness, no date on that. It was supposed to be a launch title, they've actually pushed it back to an undetermined date, but it's definitely something that for fans of Portal, especially mm -hmm. the original Portal that yeah. didn't really have an overarching story, yeah. are gonna love this game. Okay, yeah. third person First person, sorry, first person puzzle platformer, how can you go wrong? So, uh, moving on, we got uh, one more game before the break. We're gonna talk about Rhyme. So, staying with the kind of sublime, esoteric, yeah. not, so, not necessarily story-driven stuff. So you saw this trailer with me. This one's coming out from Tequila Works. Somewhere, maybe next year, uh, for the PS4 only thus far. What did you think about the trailer? First off, here we go again. PlayStation, PlayStation 4 exclusive so far. I mean, this seems to be a reoccurring theme now. Mm -hmm. you know, when, I first, when I first saw this, I was instantly reminded of Journey. It, it has yes. that vibe, it's like Journey meets Ico. You know, it, Absolutely, it, it, you nailed it. It's, it's, it got a little bit of the, the Witness kind of vibe to it, but I mean, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's from a different perspective. I mean, it's, it's a third person kind of a deal going on. But I mean, it's, it just it looks really cool, really atmospheric, and uh, I think it's uh, could be a bit of a sleeper for these guys. Yeah, it just seems like one of those those very unique puzzle platformers that really wants you to explore that environment. And you oh, yeah. can tell that from the trailer, all these sweeping vistas and, and like this beautiful yeah. use of color. It's it's a it's a game like like you said like Ico or Journey or, Journey, or even like the recent A Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, mm -hmm. where it's less about dialogue, less about action and more of just about feeling emotion and reading body language and really just kind of emotionally attaching to yourself to the game it, it's kind of like when you try to explain the journey like like the game journey to somebody who's never played it never read the hype why it's so good you, you, you hit a wall because it's a unique experience it's whatever you bring to the game whatever journey is to you is what's going to define your experience and i think that's what's happening with Ryan. it's going to be again one of those ones that you really defines the core of why games are interactive entertainment. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, we can have a few more examples of that. It's uh, it, like you said, it's 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 less a game and more of like a piece of art or interactive entertainment. It's it's one of the, it's one of the, give me one of those really great examples of this. And like I said, PS4 only so yeah. far. So that's coming from Rhyme. Uh, sorry, not uh, that is Rhyme, and that's coming from Tequila Works. Uh, somewhere next year, possibly 2015. We'll keep you updated. So that's Rhyme from Tequila Works, exclusive for PS4. That's coming out sometime soon. We have, don't have a date on it yet. We're gonna go to a quick break, but we're gonna come back with some more cool indie stuff, especially some retro-inspired shooter madness on Joystick Justice League. Stay tuned. Probably be speaking a little bit elevated like this. And this will be like direct address right to the lens. Oh, yeah! Uh, this is my collection here, about uh, 100 games right now. What's missing from your collection that would help, you know, make it complete? Let's make it a dare. I dare you to go out and get all the Nintendo games. I dare you to do it. How about we do it in a month? We'll do it in 30 days. And he said yes. Boom. Feels like 30 day Christmas Eve, 30 Christmas Eve in a row. <laughs> Wayne's, Wayne's World. World. Which I have never seen before. You're asking me to sell something out of my personal collection. I'm gonna take a chance and try and negotiate with you guys. Uh, one of the regulars there scooped it up at about uh, 9 or 10 a.m. this morning. So the Jetson saga continues. Yep. We should have been in Cincinnati, possibly even on our way to Indianapolis, but here we are still in Columbus. What happened? 
I got it at an exceptional price. The high price games I wanted, they weren't willing to budge a cent. The NES essentially received the baton from the arcade era and ran with it. Every game they came out with really had a level of success to one degree or another. For a period of time there, Nintendo was a word used to describe video games in general. You know, so when you see a Mario, like people are dressed up as Mario for Halloween, or you just see it in so many different places, um, and everybody instantly knows what that is. There was just a little magical quality to Nintendo that caught on with the public. That era of games relied on imagination. And they came up with a new product. Everybody wanted to see it. Everybody wanted to play it. I, I don't want to sound weird or cliche, man, but I have to say this right now, what is happening, is by far the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. I'd like to know the story for each card, like what what happened to this poor thing? Why it's in this condition? Like, it's like someone set a sandwich on it and kind of... Like, I can't even get that off. I don't even know if it's blood. I don't even want to touch it. Ew. Okay, we're back on Joystick Justice League, the inaugural episode. We're doing a big, massive indie blow up for the next gen, current gen, PC, you name it. We just talked about a whole bunch of cool, like sublime, fantasy oriented titles. Now let's get into some of the fun action stuff. We're going to start right off with something that gamers are really excited about, especially old school gamers like myself who grew up with games like River City Ransom. Well, successful backing of Kickstarter just happened for the spiritual sequel. River City Ransom Underground, which is coming from a Canadian company, uh, Canadis Creative, which is actually based out of Ottawa, Ontario. So um, you saw this trailer. What, what did you? What immediately struck you about this? Do you think this is going to still work 20 years later? I, I think it will, especially for for guys that, that love these style of games. And uh, and uh, are we looking at PS4 uh, only? Link? Uh, this one is uh, so far actually coming out. They haven't really even talked about the platforms yet. It's not like you know Mighty Number no. Nine, where they had different actual platform stretch goals. I think this one could be assumed to be multi-platform. I think you'll see this on Steam, you'll see this on okay. PSN, Xbox Live Arcade. I mean, really, this is such a, such a cult uh, franchise that I, I don't think they could ever ignore the potential of getting this on multi-platform. What, what I really like about this, if you never played River City Ransom, it, it's essentially Double Dragon, but an RPG version of like Double Dragon. So it's, it's your side-scrolling beat-em-up, but it was, it, what made River City Ransom so ahead of its time back in the day was the fact that it was non-linear. You could go to basically any stage, at any time you could go backwards, forwards, which is something you didn't even see in double games like Double Dragon and Streets of Rage back in the day. Um, but also the fact that you could go into towns and actually upgrade your character. You could buy food, you could buy new weapons, you could talk to people. It was, it was just so it was such a refreshing take on the side-scrolling beat-em-up genre. And, and what you can tell from this one is that it's trying to give it like a 16-bit makeover. As just to yeah. say, this would have been the sequel you would have seen on the Super Nintendo or the Sega Genesis. So, you know, I mean, I know that among younger gamers who didn't grow up with these old-school scrolling beat yeah, yeah. why would like a younger gamer get into something like this? I think they'll, they'll get into it because it is your side-scrolling beat-em-up. But what, they, what these guys are doing is that they're taking these old-school elements, but they're bringing in some of the, some of the, some of the stuff that we're seeing in some current action kind of games and throwing those elements into it and I don't know if that will do it's it kind of like revitalize it for a new generation and make it exactly. relevant, right? Yeah, because you know, because they, 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 they might not like just that, that traditional, but like I said, it's, it's adding some of these other elements and uh, that's going to make it really cool. Yeah, it, it seems like they're kind of going with a sandbox approach for this. Yep. I mean, they even said flat out in their Kickstarter video that they're really, like you said, they're trying to take old school game mechanics but rejig them to make them uh, more interesting dynamic. Uh, you, you saw that too in, the, in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World of Video Game, which is coming out, which, which came out from the company we're going to be talking about next. Uh, that was basically a reimagining of River City Ransom, yep. but set in, in Toronto. Yep. And, and like you said, using modern mechanics, and, and that one actually took, took off really well. I mean, especially it being did. attached to the, the Scott Pilgrim fan choice, yep. which was big around teens and preteens. So that was Tribute Games who made Scott Pilgrim. They got a big one coming out for PS4 and PC. You got excited when you saw this. It's called Mercenary Kings. Yeah. Tribute Games, of course, is based out of our country, Canada, Montreal. Uh, what did you notice about this? No, I, I first saw this and I wasn't expecting a lot. And, and it's written the name for these guys, Tribute Games. I mean, these guys are taking, you know, 
beloved kind of uh, genres of games, and they're putting their own spin, and they're putting they're putting real love into these games. I mean, this is like it's like a take take on like a Contra and Metal Slug. Oh, like, Metal Slug, absolutely. But, but I mean, I mean if it, but like to a whole new level with these guys. Yeah, and I think that new level is what we were we were both kind of agreed on. This oh, yeah. really feels like a side-scrolling Borderlands, oh, yeah. just like this open concept, jump and jump out, multi-mission, uh, kind of like an action RPG in a sense. Yeah. I mean, it is a side-scrolling platformer, but we already learned that you can make your own guns. There's incredibly deep gun crafting in this. Yeah. Like I said, you got four-player jump and jump co-op like you had in Borderlands, so you can essentially join in on somebody else's mission regardless of whether you've actually done that or not. Yeah, that, that's, that's going to make it so cool too. It, it, it's it's they could they very well could have just been it's just a single player game and it still would have been pretty cool that I mean to have you know other people just join whenever they want to in a multiplayer element I mean, that just that makes it even sweeter. Oh yeah, and I think just again the customization and again the varied environments. Even if you do decide to play this as a single player game, there'll be just enough to unlock sweet. and discover in this. Yeah. And just you know great action. You know everybody loves a game like Contra, Gunstar Heroes. It's just fast frenetic action. It's. Uh, it, it just looks like a lot of fun, and, and it also has that 16-bit art style, which is slowly starting to gain popularity now that we've kind of, you know, done all the 8-bit resurgences, all the pixel art stuff. Now I can kind of see where, like, you know, again, like the old Neo Geo kind of graphics are starting to come more into, like, indie games, and we're starting to see, slowly start seeing things come circle in that era as well. Yeah, and, and a lot of it's probably going to come from these guys, because, I, mean, I mean, you know, there's so much to work with, and, and uh, you know, if this is... Anything more I'm expected. I think these guys are gonna make more. And, and, you can tell is... they have a love for the for the era. They're not just oh, yeah. they're not looking at it with like this kind of ironic, you know, critical eye where it's 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 just like oh it's it's old it's kind of cheesy. No, they actually you can tell they they truly adore uh, pixel art and, and 80s and 90s culture. So and, and it really shows in their efforts. So that's Mercenary Kings coming from Tribute Games. That's coming out uh, probably sometime near the end of the year. It's supposed to be a PS4 launch title. Uh, it's already available on PC, so you can actually get this right now on Steam. But if you are a next-gen console owner, you can see this on PS4 probably by the end of this year. Um, moving in with kind of like retro resurgent pixel art games, there's this new one uh, that's coming out finally for PS4, PC, and the web, which actually made it splash on the Ouya. Now this is essentially the flagship game for the Ouya, it's called Towerfall Ascension. So um, yeah, I, I haven't played on the Ouya yet, but we saw a pretty extended gameplay. What, what did you notice immediately about this game that might make it appeal to other people right now? Well. Uh, 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 I think it's going to appeal to some people, and uh, this might sound a little weird, but uh, I think people that are fans of Smash Brothers might get into this. Oh yeah, but, I mean, it, I never even thought of that. But yeah. it's, it's not it's not just uh, side to side. I mean, it says right in, this, this, there's some vertical elements to this as well. It, it seems to be all vertical, so we're literally is yeah. nothing previous to the tower. Like there's no horizontal nature, which is interesting because most uh, like MOBAs I see like this usually happen in that fashion. It's it's going to be a it's going to be a fun multiplayer game, and. and uh, and online as well. I think that this uh, could have done pretty well, though, depending on what platforms it comes out on. Yeah, it's just, it's, I'm sure it's going to get ported pretty much everything on this. So, I mean, I, what I can immediately tell from this is that it's off, off, it's going to click right away with fans of Terraria. I mean, this just oh, yeah. feels like like sure. the best of the multiplayer aspects of Terraria. It's coming in there. Also, for fans of Awesome Knots, awesome you know, nice. like yeah. 2D kind of MOBAs. Yeah. And, and just, and also fans of like Legend of Zelda Four Swords, you know, which which came out for Game Boy Advance and the GameCube. And I remember being at, at a party recently at the Personal Computer Museum in Brantford at uh, Sid Bolton's place, uh, and we actually got to watch a few eight, nine, ten year olds actually connected on a GameCube yeah. playing that Four Swords, and what, they were in trance. It was too cool, man. Like, a, and by the way, if you haven't been to the Personal Computer Museum in Brantford. Do yourself a favor and check it out. This guy has, to the best of my knowledge, he has the most complete video complete game Xbox collection. collection complete Not, game, complete, complete game collection. collection. Period, guys. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, if you haven't checked this place out, I mean, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. Yeah, so that's the personal computing museum in Brantford, Ontario. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Towerfall. This is again making waves on the mobile market. It's coming out for PS4. You know, it just looks like a, a pleasure to play, fast frenetic action, and. Uh, Keeping it in line, we got one more to talk about before the break. Another game that uh, that Joe just turned me on to, which is only available on iOS right now. Um, but uh, this this looks like a, a nice throwback as well to certain games of yesteryear on the PC. Yeah, 
What this is device six. This is coming out from this came out from Samogu Games just recently. Tell me a bit about this game. Why it's cool. Well, Samogu Games, uh, the, the guys aren't all that well known. You know, they, they've done some other cool stuff. They've done Gear Walk and Beast Deep Bandit. But I mean, th this is is really cool, guys. This is basically it's a text-based adventure game with some horror elements thrown. You, you're literally yeah, the levels are basically what you're, re you're reading. It's it's, it's the text, and you're, 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 you're hearing clues, you're seeing visual clues, and you're navigating around the world. And, and, and it's, it's using the, the elements of, of the iPad, you, you're not just scrolling through and reading, you, you have to turn. And you're navigate. actually using the geometric system of the, of the iPad to, itself to, to engage the game. To solve the, the puzzle, it's, it, you're, you're basically, you're, it's like you're solving the, solving the puzzle of the, these chapters of, of this book. I mean, it's one, it's one of the more unique games that, that I've seen in a while. And, and we're, I'm seeing a lot of this kind of stuff on, on uh, the portable devices, especially in the iPad. So these guys are willing to take the uh, gambles and make some really cool games like this, and I'm hoping to see more of stuff like this. Yeah, it's weird. Like, when I watched you playing it, it's almost like a quasi-virtual reality in the sense that you're reading this book, but you're flipping your iPad and moving around the room yeah. to solve this puzzle. So it's almost like your, your own augmented reality puzzle platformer, but it also it lends credence to the text-based story ventures of the old PC gaming days, which are still a hit. I mean, yeah. those games never really went away. They just, they became, they became kind of like an underground niche, but I, I'm starting to see, like with games like Device 6, yeah. that this may be something that the mobile market can really latch onto as, yeah. as, as, as like a, a, a platform kind of exclusive. Yeah, and, and, and not a very expensive game. Uh, I think it was maybe 299 or 399. You yeah, at 399. I think I think it's a good buy for anybody that's, that wants to play something unique, and not just playing these traditional games. I, I think it's worth checking out. Yeah, just the sense of depth will just really blow you away. I mean, yeah. it, it's really it's, it reminds me of those old picture storybooks uh, when we were kids, where it would have a, a cutout in the page, and you would see something in the background. And it's like when you move your phone, you can actually see different parallax layers of, of like a, of like photographic imagery yeah. moving. It's, cool. it's a very trippy experience, but also a very compelling story and a great way of presenting it. But actually making you interactive with your actual device. And it's making I mean, you make you think. It's not just a mindless game that you're playing. You really, really got to think your way through this. It's uh, it took me like an hour to to complete that first chapter. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I really had to think my way through it. I mean, too cool. Absolutely. So incredible stuff. Uh, actually, before we go to break, we still got a few more titles to even talk about. There's so much to talk about. Let's get back into console territory with this game that's come out from Clay Entertainment. These were the makers of Shank 1 and 2. They're coming out with their new title somewhere next year called Don't Starve. So I talked about this on an old Joystick Judgment Day episode, but now that there's been a few more trailers, um, I want to talk to somebody else about it. So um, this is a survival craft game. So what, what's survival craft for anybody who doesn't know what survival craft is? Because it's still a pretty new genre. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, going into this, I thought, I thought that it was, it was going to be like a, maybe almost kind of like a mod that came out for, for Minecraft. Not that at all. I mean, uh, these guys made, made Shank. Really, really cool game too. If you get a chance to play it, play it. Uh, I, I was kind of surprised by, by what I saw. You, you're, you're literally you're in a world creating stuff and there's so many kind of cool elements to this so you're, you're trying to survive and it's not going to be just for yourself right yeah absolutely i think like where it kind of diverges from other survival craft games like minecraft and terraria where I, th I think we're, with Minecraft and Terraria, the whole idea is to see what you can build, okay? Yeah. Like how, what, where you can bring your, it's like a Lego set, like where you can bring yeah. your own creativity to design the world. Where with, with Don't Starve, it's more of an arcade approach in the yeah. sense that you get one life. You, you don't, you don't yeah. come back and, and start again. It's always randomly generated. Every, yeah. every experience is randomly generated. So it reminds me of a game that came out for PlayStation 3 and Vita last year called Tokyo Jungle, yeah. where it's essentially this, this, again, this new genre of generational gameplay that's really good for gaming on the go and a quick fix. So you, you, like with, with Don't Start, you're gonna see how long you can last, but even if you only last, say, a year or two in the game, you've at least got your quick fix and, and you can go play it again. So it's, it's yeah. I like I like the cartoon style, it's, it's hand-drawn. Yeah. It, it also has a lot of humor, this, the fact that you can throw parties for the women yeah. creatures. And, and it just seems to actually have some kind of overarching story, whereas I think Minecraft and Terraria, it's more up to your imagination and the stories that you create within your experiences, where this actually seems to have some kind of overarching area. And it's going to be one of those uh, games to it that, uh, that you're going to play that I think that, you know, it's going to be one where 
not everybody's going to have the same experience. Everybody's going to get something for themselves out of this. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's just this whole idea of like randomly generated gameplay that keeps it fresh every single time. So it's something to be excited about. So that's Don't Start from Play Entertainment coming out for PS4 and PC. Uh, so now our next game is, again, aligning with that whole new indie focus that Sony is really touting. This one's Doki Doki Universe coming from Human Nature Studios. And I think this is uh, pretty much their first game of the game. I mean, they, they do have some fame developers. I think one of the developers actually worked on Toe Jam and Earl. So, yeah. yeah. So what did you see from, from this kind of quirky little little hit that's coming out for PS4, PS3, and Vita in unison? Yeah, it, it's good. It's got a really, really quirky, kind of really kind of neat, kind of hand-drawn thing. And it, it's basically a pl puzzle platforming game with some social as aspects thrown into boot. Yeah, it really does feel like uh, like Little Big Planet meets The Sims. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, exactly it doesn't seem like there's, there's really like an emphasis on action here. It's really about how you interact with all the NPCs. Yeah. But not only the NPCs, but how how you also interact with, with the people on your PlayStation network. So basically this game, it has a very long convoluted story, but essentially you're this robot who was abandoned by his family, left on this planet, and now you you've been tasked with the with the task you've been tasked with getting your humanity back. So essentially, this game's kind of like a moral tale, and then it's gonna act, put all these mini games in front of you and all these quizzes you have to do to kind of rate what kind of person you are, like what kind yeah. of humanity you have. Which this could go in a lot of interesting directions, yeah. especially once you start getting. Facebook integration yeah. involved, Twitter integration, PSN. I think you're really gonna find a lot about yourself, but not only that, but also these other otherwise faceless people you keep meeting online. <laughs> Being a dealer is saying, you know what, I'm a better human than you. <laughs> See, that's the, that's, that's, the, right. that's the weird part about Sony's quirkiness is that yeah. there's always some kind of sinister yeah. underlying note to some of the most happy games. Like it's, it's like that game Ho Hogum that's coming out <laughs> uh, where yeah. it's like it's supposed to be like this trippy <laughs> art experiment but really it's just a big sperm flying yeah. around and like impregnating eggs. Yeah. <laughs> it's always like this subliminal kind of thing going on. So, But it, it looks exciting. I mean I love the hand-drawn art to this. Yeah, it looks pretty sweet. Very original, very, very quirky. Original. For, again, for fans of like Little Big Planet, you know, obviously you're gonna lock stickers, decoration. So there's a lot of customization going on with this, and, and I like the way that the fact that it's gonna sync with all three platforms. So yeah. whether you have a PS3 Vita or PS4, you're gonna get the exact same experience, and you can take that on the go. Yeah, and that, that's that's a, actually a big thing with the PS4. Uh, we'll do some of that stuff. The remote play functionality, I have to say, I, I I've already tested it out on Battlefield and NBA 2K14 and Killzone. It has to be seen to believe. The remote play functionality, the, the idea that you can stream PS4 on the go is a very, very real reality, okay? I don't even have the greatest Wi-Fi signal, and I'm running Battlefield at a near 60 frames a second on my Vita with no artifacting, no pixelization. It's a gorgeous thing, so the next generation is looking bright. And continuing on with that brightness and how the indie revolution that's happening right now is really going to drive home what, where gaming is going to go now. There's this game now coming out called Octodad from Young Horses, all right? So this is a sequel to this underground PC hit. It is a buzz right now. This is the game that you would least likely figure to be a buzz, but yet it's got gamers' imaginations just by the by the ball grip. So what did you see from Octodad? You seem to enjoy this a lot. Uh, uh, I thought this game was hilarious. I mean, the, the, this, you're, you're literally, you're an octopus trying to make his way through normal every day of the life. I mean... <laughs> it's, it's exactly what it is. It's a day in the life game of you trying to pose as a human being. Yeah. It, uh, but what's the problem with that? It's, a, it's so bizarre. It's because you're... You got tentacles. You got tentacles, and like you, you're, you're, you're literally, you could, you could, you could take this guy through a grocery store and just flip him around and just smash take everything off. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, it's, it's great to see him in the living away. room trying to put the yeah. silverware in the in the china way and you just smash it every place. <laughs> and this goes to what like I, I, this is a oh, this man. is a great example of parody. Yeah. Like I said before on my previous podcast. When you get to the end of like a console generation, when you've done everything you can with certain graphics engines and certain gameplay mechanics that we're accustomed to in 3D action adventure games like this, that's when parody starts to come in. That's the same thing that happens in movies. Yeah. When you come to the end of like a genre, you start to get parody, and this is pure parody. The fact that it purposely makes the control shitty. Yeah. Like it actually wants, like it wants to deconstruct your playing experience and, and, and to actually make and to lampoon the idea of game playing itself. Yeah, and it's uh, it's gonna be one of those games that I ho hope it does well, and, and it's it's gonna be a game that uh, it's 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 hilarious. 
being an octopus, just do whatever you want. It's it's a game that, that I hope doesn't get overlooked because I mean it just. It looks I don't like, think it will. It I, I, like I, I think Sony's completely behind this game. Oh, yeah. uh, this is again like with Mercenary Kings, The Witness. And um, don't starve. This was kind of pushed to the forefront. Like yeah. they actually showed this in E3 they being did, yeah. played up with like Odd World, New and Tasty, and all these major indie titles that are gonna mm -hmm. kind of drive this next generation of gaming. So again, great stuff coming out from uh, Young Horses. And in that vein, you also showed me you're you're like the iOS cool game man. You so showed me another game in that vein. This one's called Clumsy Ninja. So this one's coming from, this, this already came out just recently from Natural Motion, only on iOS. So what can you tell me about this, just this very deceptively, deceptively simple game? It, it is very simple. You're, 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 start, you're starting out, you got this ninja. And at the, at the very beginning, he is he's a clumsy ninja. He is completely useless. You can't, you can't take him more than a foot and he's tripping and falling on his ass. And we, basically the idea here is you're trying to build him up. From this clumsy ninja into a, into a real ninja by by training him to do stuff, you know. By uh, you can you can take him, you can flip him and throw him through a basketball hoop. You can toss him across the screen. You, you can actually you know, teach him to do some stuff. But you can, it's one of these games where you, you can just do whatever you want with him. But it's almost like the it's almost like the anti Tamagotchi. It's, like, yeah. it's almost like the complete reversal where you're not really nurturing. Are you nurturing him? Are you training him? Well, you're you're, you're nurturing, but, but I mean, you you have the freedom to, to treat him like uh, to like basically nerd. be sadistic. Yeah, you, you can do whatever you want with him. You, you don't have to train him. You can just toss him around if you want to. You you, you have freedom to do whatever you want. I love ragdoll games. Oh, it's, 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 you know what this reminded me of me when I was playing it. Like it reminded me of Pain for the PS3, where again using ragdoll physics to yeah. just. Beat the shit out of like a, of like an online character and just have a hoop doing it. So this is again a little quick fix that you know if you got your iPhone. How much was this game? Uh, this was a free game, Mike. It was free. It can't be free. And this was free to play. And, it, and uh, this was something that uh, that was actually got showed up at the Apple conference earlier this year. Yeah. To, to kind of showcase with the hardware. And, and it took these guys a little bit of time to come with this. Uh, they talked about this early in the year, and it was supposed to come out fairly soon. But they, they they took some time with it. And I was really surprised that they made it free to play. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I can actually see that like little technical nuances in, in the way this game plays that I didn't see on previous iOS games. So I think you're right. It's kind of it's it's almost like a nice little tech demo. It is like the rubber ducks word for the yep. PS3, where you can kind of see where this new technology is going to be adopted in future games. So something that's free to download, you can kind of see where the next generation of uh, iOS games are coming from. So uh, don't go away. We got one more break. We're going to come back with some breaking news on the actual industry itself. A little bit of shifting of positions in the game world. We're also going to talk about some of the games we've been playing. And uh, yeah, so we'll be back after this break. Thanks for watching. Okay, we're back for the final part of this inaugural episode of Joystick Justice League. And what we want to talk about now is actually some really big news in the industry. I think it's getting almost a little glossed over in the mainstream media. Um, a certain developer by the name of John Carmack... I did, I, I did a spit take when I first heard about someone. Uh, left it for good. We're talking about... I think, yeah. he, I think he has some sort of... Um, some sort of like uh, some role in terms of like overseeing future development of maybe Doom titles, but that's it. He left for Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift, yeah. Uh, Oculus Rift. So uh, if you've been following Oculus Rift in the industry, it's still not really mainstream news yet because it's still majorly in development. But as you've been informing me, there's been some major improvements to the Oculus system for us. So if, if you don't know what Oculus Rift is yet, it's essentially an independent virtual reality system that is actually starting to make virtual reality a tangible reality for gaming. Yeah, this was, uh, for, I'm pretty sure it was a Kickstarter project that started out. And uh, what they've managed to do with this, you know, I've, I've tried a few of these other ones that, that have come out. And the problem with these uh, virtual reality headsets is that what's called latency. And what that I mean is you move your head and then it goes. What they've managed to do with this is they've managed to get that latency period down to almost nothing, mm -hmm. which is pretty sweet. So you turn your head, the screen turns directly in conjunction with your head. Exactly. Whereas there would have been a bit of a delay before. That, that was always the issue. But there's a bit of a trade-off though. Because of uh, some of these games that you're playing, and because it's so instantaneous in the, in the reaction to your, to your head movement, is that 
pretty well everybody has been trying this has been saying that they made it motion sick. Yeah, huge part. I mean, and that again goes to any type of virtual reality, whether it's 3D movie watching, there's always that motion sickness problem, which they are trying to fix. Like I've been following the Oculus Rift development as well. I mean, the, the most recent boast a few months ago was the fact that they were actually starting to get able to get the technology up to 1080p yeah. and get it to a good frame rate where you wouldn't see that stuttery problem, which you saw in like early 3D movies. And, and, and kind of going off on a tangent for a sec, Really, that is the reason why The Hobbit had to be done at 48 frames a second. People thought that it looked too real and, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But it's really the only way that 3D can work because if it's being, if, if you're running 3D, uh, especially with the camera pans, it's going to stutter. I noticed that when I saw Tron Revolution. That was the only 3D movie I went to see. I got a huge headache because of the stuttery motion. Whereas I think I could handle The Hobbit. I haven't seen it on 3D, but I feel that with that smooth panning motion, it would work. And that's yeah. what they're kind of bringing into Oculus Rift now. They're, they're getting up to that 48 frames, 60 frames a second, which basically can't be done on consoles yet. They've already come out and said that PS4, Xbox One will not be seeing Oculus Rift support because it's just, it's too major for the current infrastructure, which is why it hasn't really publicly been released yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. And, and you know, bringing Kermak on, you know, maybe, maybe he could, uh, because this guy's obviously done some cool stuff, you know, one of the guys that started the whole first person shooter genre. Yeah, he's and, coming uh, as their chief technology officer, or their CTO. So it'll be interesting to see if he can help these guys solve some of these issues that, that, that they're having. Yeah, and I think what the most recent thing I heard was that they've, they're have they they're pretty much ready to go into the 4K realm. Um, and it's funny because the, the reason why the development process has been so long is because they've had to rethink game developing to the core. One of the major things they said when they ported Team Fortress 2 over to Oculus Rift was that when you get inside the game, you all of a sudden feel like a dwarf. Yeah. So they had to like resize all the doors, the walls, the scope of the environment to actually make you feel like you're a six foot character. And, and I see where they're going because if you've played the beginning of say Kill, Killzone Shadowfall, when you play a nine-year-old self, you walk around and you can tell there's a height differential. You know, the ceilings are really tall. Yeah. But the way that games like Call of Duty Ghosts and Team Fortress 2 are, if you automatically pour those over Oculus Rift, you will feel like a five-foot tall midget. And that's why all these games have to be radically redesigned to support yeah. Oculus Rift. Yeah, or, or at least, uh, you know, have some kind of support, uh, you know, whether it's like a patch or something to get on to, to yeah. allow, you know, to, to play it that way. Otherwise, I mean, uh, you know, it, We'll see what happens with it. I mean, uh, it's it, it, it's gonna be really cool if they come with it. And another thing that they're looking at uh, adding onto is not just with the vision. Uh, I even saw that they basically have like a trend book yes, kind of stuff. Yes. So that you're not only gonna be looking, but in conjunction, you're 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 gonna, you're gonna also be moving and like almost kind of fully interacting. Yeah, in like a, in 360 in degrees world. of area. They've it's, already tested this out with Minecraft. I, I've yeah. seen people doing the Minecraft mod for Oculus Rift and literally walking around the game world yeah. and spinning around, they're spinning the camera with their own body movement. So it's, it's in the pipeline, they're making this work. But right now, I mean, the Oculus, work, the, the Oculus Rift does work. I mean, they've, they've been able to port Skyrim over to it. They've done Surgeon Simulator very successfully. It works for those kind of small scale games, but again, I think, to, to truly start taking huge franchises like Battlefield and like Half-Life over to it, we're, we're still a few years away. Yeah, it, it's, you know, uh, I don't think that they should rush to try and get this out. I think that they should maybe take their time a little bit, you know, don't take too long because the technology start changing and then they'll have to start rewriting again. But I mean, I mean take their time enough to, to try and nail this, this down. And I, I hope it works for them. Yeah, and you've got the competition. I mean, it's, it's yeah. widely known that Sony is working on their own version of virtual reality. We, we already saw it. Like, it was, it's almost two years now since they debuted uh, the PlayStation Move enabled um, virtual reality technology for the PS3 that was quickly scrapped once people saw how primitive it was. But we know that Sony's working on this. And I, if I were a betting man, I would say that the PS5 generation will be about two things, VR and 4K gaming. But that's still a few years away, so I think both camps, like Sony and Oculus Rift, whoever else is working on virtual reality, I know there are others. I mean, I've read about others. Oculus Rift is the only one that's really made some headway, but this is really, you have to pay attention to this if you're a gamer. I, th I think you know that this is really where gaming is going in the next decade. It, it, it's it's definitely where it's going to be going, and uh, and uh, you know, and, and like you said, Sony and Microsoft, you know, they're paying attention to this too. And uh, you know, and if you know, if Oculus Rift, if they don't start sorting this thing out. I mean, worst case scenario, you might even see Sony or Microsoft maybe even try and buy these guys out for some of these passes that they have. And I hope that doesn't happen because I, I would rather see 
when these independent guys come out with this because, I mean, for obvious reasons. I think you're right because you know what? I think that the the, the inexplicable tie that the, the sorry inextricable tie that Oculus Rift seems to have to Steam right now and especially to Valve keeps the PC faction of the market healthy in comparison to the looming threat of the consoles, which are catching up to the PC's territory. I mean, we see it in, in, like, in, in the fact that MMOs are now a tangible reality yeah. on next-gen consoles. Really, that line between PC gaming and console gaming is, is getting smaller yeah. and smaller. And I think Oculus Rift being tied to PC gaming is what's gonna keep that side of things competitive. So that's yeah. big news right now. Really though, like John Carmack left it. So what does that mean for like Doom and and Cal and Quake? Uh, you know, I, I, is it I, done? I, I don't. I don't think that they're done. I, I'm hoping that uh, some of the guys that are still up behind it have learned enough from that they can keep this thing going. Yeah, and that's what the official release is: is that Carmack left enough knowledge with the developers to continue on on his franchises. But it, yeah. it it really is that effect sometimes that when you lose that figurehead, you really lose the heart and soul. I hope that's not the case, but that really was the case arguably with Infinity Ward when Vince Ampel and Jason West left to make Titanfall. Now Infinity Ward's not even close to the company it used to be. So hopefully not the same thing with id but honestly the way things i see going i can see id pretty much being subsumed by bethesda and just kind of joining their umbrella i hope not you know and uh you know we'll see you know i'm hoping that he hasn't like completely cut ties with him i'm hoping that maybe he could still be like, like kind of a like consultant yeah and that's and, what the word i was looking for and, consultancy and, and, and kind of keep keep them uh not necessarily keep them on track but you know to still help these guys come up because i mean i don't think we're too long away from seeing a do four so I hope not. I mean, I, I think Doom Three still has not a lasting appeal how with long the ago BFG. Was Doom 3? A long time ago, but then so you saw the interest that was sparked in it with the BFG edition that yeah. came out. Just the fact that you could play online Doom One and Two seamlessly <laughs> on <laughs> PS3 cool. and Xbox and PC, just amazing. So cool. there's obviously still a lot of love. Obviously, like look at the like the attendance at QuakeCon every year. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of love for the houses that Carmack built. So uh, hopefully, we won't see the end of that. But again. The fact that he is entering the Oculus Rift arena can only be good things for that company. For sure. Yeah. So uh, that's 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 some big news. To kind of end things off this inaugural jam-packed info episode of Joystick Justice League, we basically just want to talk about some of the games we're playing. And if you have anything to say about these games, please feel free to put some info into the comments below and we can have a little discussion. So what are you playing right now? Right now, I got two big games I'm playing. Clumsy Ninja that I talked about before. I've already kind of talked about that, so I'm not going to touch on it too much. But the other one, other one that I've been playing, PS3. This game alone sells the PS3, and I'm talking about The Last of Us, man. Yes. I know I, I've been blogging about this. I've been talking to people, about it, and it's it's. You know, some people are telling me to kind of knock it off already, but I mean, I love this game. That's The Last of Us. Yeah, you know what? I I think that because The Last of Us came out the spring ahead of the big fall rush and stuff. I think, you know, even though it had its 10 out of 10 rating, it had its great sales, I think that The Last of Us has the danger of kind of falling to the side of the hype that Assassin's Creed is getting right now, that Battlefield's getting right now. Um, this is a game for the ages. I mean, whether, whether you love or hate what it's about, I mean, I personally didn't really like the ending. I'm not gonna spoil it. I think it was a little negative, but I can't give enough weight to the fact that this game is revolutionary in terms of how it, it blurs the lines between between filmmaking and game playing, even in a greater way, I think, than Uncharted was ever, ever able to achieve. I mean, you were saying this. I mean, just the fact that the story and the gameplay meld so well together, it's just really an achievement and, and really a, a progression of narrative storytelling in gaming. I, I, I think they're really starting to hit their stride. And you see it in GTA V as well, just no cutscenes, yeah. melding in, in and out, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's... Uh... Uh, I haven't been able to put this game down. I mean, I'll, I've, I've gone off and played other games, and just today I was in the middle of playing Ghost, and you know what? I gotta go back and play some more Lost. But so it's, it's one of those games where, I mean, it just it never goes away. It's almost like a sexual disease, Mike. It keeps coming back and asking for more, and it keeps pulling me back in, <laughs> keeps pulling me back in. And well, without those sore red spots and yeah, embarrassing I mean, images. It, I can't say enough about it. I mean, I love this game, and I, I'm not the only one that feels this way. And, uh, I, and, with Naughty Dog, I mean, I'm really excited to see what these guys are going to do. I, I think this was it. I think Last of Us was really the moment where everybody took notice and said Naughty Dog is really up there with Bungie. They are. And Bioware, they're just the top of the top. I think, 
I don't think we can expect any wrong because they know how to make games. They, they take the, the years and the time they need to polish these games. They don't rush them out every year. They don't give a shit about what your shareholders think. They make games that are games for the sit, for the love of gaming. And, and if you haven't played Last of Us, man, what a great game. It just, it's long and there's just all this extra DLC that's going to continue the story now. So, I mean, if you haven't played it you know, and, and you've been completely blinded by all this next gen hype, really go back to your last gen and, and this is a classic of the ages. Uh, myself, I have actually been getting to the PS4 now, so I'm playing Resogun, uh, the new one by Housemark from the makers of Super Stardust HD, and, and what a great launch title. Not a huge AAA game, but just a pretty hardcore game. This game is hard. It's a twin stick shooter, but it's done on kind of like a, a, a gyroscope, so it's, it's like a new way of playing and just really shows you all the cool new particle effects that are capable like of all the little art. You know, just all the things that can be happening on the screen one time, and just a really well balanced gameplay. They're taking elements of Super Stardust HD, but adding this whole new kind of basketball kind of theme of uh, you just have to play it. It's free right now. Even if you don't have a PS4, if you have a PS Plus account, all you have to do is go onto the web store of Sony, click on download for your Plus account, put it in your history, and then whenever you actually do decide to get your PS4, it will be in your library. For fans of old arcade twin six shooters and looking for like a real hardcore, well-balanced, well-crafted challenge, you can't go much further than Resogun. And I also have to give a quick shout out to XCOM Enemy Within, which is something I'm getting right back into. This is almost two years, uh, almost two years now after XCOM Enemy Unknown came out for PC, PS3, Xbox 360. That game was a revelation, and, and, and if you watched uh, my old review of Joystick Judgment Day, which is also on this page, I gave it a 10 out of 10. I mean, actually, I didn't post it, but I could post it at some point, or maybe do a review of this, which I will be doing at some point. This game really simplifies the RTS structure and makes it intuitive for consoles. And, and, and they didn't really promote this game much when it came out. It was a sleeper hit. It was really word of mouth that kind of drove this kind of rising fan base that XCOM is starting to get. Uh, it came out of nowhere. I mean, I didn't see it coming. I didn't until I, uh, until I read something about it. I mean, I didn't have any, any knowledge of it. Like, talk about just, like, a game with flaws that almost feels flawless. Like, I mean, yeah. in a sense that you, you, it is so good, so deep, so original, the way this game is, is made that you, 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 you ignore the odd screen tear, the odd <laughs> scratchy vocal. And what's really great about this is that if you get this on the consoles, you actually have to flip another 40 bucks to get this new XCOM Enemy Within Edition, which basically includes XCOM Enemy Unknown. All the slingshot DLC and then the new add-on which PCs can just down PC players can just download the add-on for within but you have to go out and buy the full disc $40 to get this new experience and I'll tell you right now it's worth it okay all the audio glitches and graphical glitches I was complaining about in Enemy Unknown and especially all the the matchmaking glitches that were happening in the online have been fixed this game has been polished. It looks better now. I'll say, like, even in the tutorial, when you're playing and it's there's lightning striking, you can actually see like the screen turn white when the lightning flashes, and, and this, I can tell the sound effects have been re-recorded and done better. But now it's not only just graphical and sound enhancements. The the enemy within add-on is is amazing. It's just the fact that you add not only alien, you not only do you have the alien research you can do, you have the weapons research, but now you have melding research. So you can actually craft cybernetic implants for your soldiers. You can literally turn your soldiers into a mech, which is fucking amazing. This game can be played forever. I mean, it is one of the hardest games I know. It is one of those games where the first time I played it, I was ten hours into the campaign. I had made a, a mistake in research in my research tree about six hours previously, and I got to a point where I couldn't go on anymore. It was the game was beating me down, and I realized, oh my god, I should have done this. And that's why when you play this game, you gotta juggle saves. It's it's a must because at some point when you play this through the first time and you're trying to get used to the mechanics of this game, you will screw up and you'll pay for it. Suddenly. As long as you have a save somewhere down the line where you yeah, can go back and right. try again, and you will try again a lot of times. And and, and, and even if you you don't, if you get tired of the single player campaign, then you've got this robust multiplayer, which actually works like the opposite of the Call of Duty formula, in the sense that we're in Call of Duty, you always unlock perks, you unlock things by playing. This gives you everything up front and just gives you skill points to build your team. So it essentially is a chess match. It's almost like a card battle, but in a third quarter RTS. And, and, and what's great too about this is that 
Traditional RTSs like Command and Conquer typically don't divert too much from that overhead view, no. but what's great is that XCOM actually uses beautifully placed cutscenes yeah. to keep the action fresh and frenetic and just great ambiance. And again, going back to that UFO theme that was kind of abandoned since the 90s, which is slowly making it back to the mainstream. So I, I can't say enough about this game. You don't even have to get enemy within. If you've got an iPad, you can get enemy unknown on that fully on the iPad. Enemy Within is now available. The add is on Steam and you can get the full version for about 40 bucks on 360 PS3. You will not be disappointed. If you ever wanted to feel like what it was play like to, to, to play like Battlefield or Call of Duty as the general and not the soldier, this is it right here. So, um, been an amazing inaugural episode. I gotta thank my uh, my host, Joe Morin, for showing up for the premiere episode of Joystick Justice League. I hope you enjoyed what you see, uh, what you saw today, and we're gonna be back for a lot more. I know you've got a couple reviews coming up. What are you gonna be reviewing soon? I'm gonna be reviewing Arkham Asylum and Bastion for iPad. Absolutely, and I will be reviewing sound shapes for the PS4, and of course, I will also be looking at Dragon's Crown, which came out for PS3 and Vita just this past year. Another one of those games you make if you blink, you would have missed it, but for fans of you know the old Dungeons and Dragons arcade games, you're gonna love this. So a lot of great stuff coming from this network. Make sure you subscribe to YouTube and you guys all have a great day. Support indie games and we'll talk to you soon. Peace. Peace.